car takes me there. It's so good to be back. I didn't realize that it's now 14 times, Brother Bernard, but whatever it is, we, my wife and I, we have enjoyed always coming and may the Lord truly bless the word and I hope that you, as a congregation, will be blessed. Hello, how are you? Yes, and I know you. That goes back, Kim, Kim, you go back a long time. Yes, uh, I saw Kim for the first time when she, with her parents, walked in to First Baptist in Elliott Lake. And that it goes back to probably around 1900 and uh, 92, 91, 92, somewhere around there, Kim, right? When you came up with your mom and your brother and your sister, and yes, it was a blessed time, especially when I think of all the people that came and did the ministry to the mentally challenged people at First Baptist. I think sometimes that group had up to 50 people in that particular setting which came together every Friday and uh, they did a tremendous job. Well, beloved, I hope you have brought your Bibles along because you will need it again. And this morning I want to turn your attention to an Old Testament passage, a familiar passage, out of Exodus chapter 3. You probably know the setting. You probably know that Moses is the one who comes and sees a burning bush. That is the setting. And then there, in that particular setting, there is our text. Our text, which is verse 14 and uh, 13, actually, and 14. And I want to just limit myself to this particular portion. And so if you have your Bibles open, please stand for the reading of God's word as I read verse 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, you are again speaking to us through your word. And we thank you. We thank you that you are the great I am. And you come to us in Jesus, whom we profess and proclaim Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We ask your blessing upon this gathering this morning. And may you hide your servant behind the cross that we may only behold the great I am. 
and then prepare us for the communion celebration and give thanks and praise for Jesus, who is our Lord, our Redeemer, our Savior, and the Messiah we eagerly await. Thank you again for your presence here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Beloved, no name ever breathed is so full of mystery and persistent in majesty as the one that I just shared with you from Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. I am who I am. This name is truly expressing the personal entity of deity. Eternal being is the essential source and the essence of all vitality and volition and vision. And here, here in this text, we, you and I, we meet the sublimity in simplicity, the maximum in minimum, the undefinable defined in a spoken definition, the inexplicable is expressed in these marvelous words, I am who I am. Now the occasion of this revelation is of deep interest. God has previously expressed his title Elohim to the patriarchs. By its meaning, it suggests the God who wills all, and he does it. And now he comes into the life of Moses again and is about to make himself known to Israel as the God Jehovah by demonstrating himself that he does everything that he has prophetically announced already previously. Moses is standing on the Mount of Horeb. You probably know that particular mountain as the mountain of God. And you probably have a vision even of if you ever have seen that great movie from Charles Heston about the Ten Commandments, you probably have a picture of the wilderness that is before Moses. I have never been close to the Mount of Horeb. However, I was in that particular area on two occasions. And I have seen the wilderness, the ruggedness of this particular type of mountain range. And here, in that particular mountain range on the Mount of Horeb, we see Moses. Moses, as he will be commissioned by God to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses, who has to leave his particular shepherd duty that he has been in charge of for years and years, actually almost 40 years, 
He has, a, he has become accustomed to that particular setting as a shepherd. And now God comes, and now God is telling him, you have to return to Egypt. Egypt that he left 40 years before, fleeing for his life, according to Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. Because you remember, he had killed an Egyptian. And he was concerned. Will he be recognized? Will they recognize him? Moses had also other misgivings. By this time, the Israelites might have forgotten him altogether. Will they really receive him as the, the, as the prophesied deliverer and spokesman sent from God? Furthermore, the task assigned to him seems impossible because Moses, and I can really identify with that, had some speech limitations. And I can really understand him because if you are speaking to sheep for almost 40 years, and now all of a sudden he is to speak to a people and to Pharaoh, the one who might have recognized him. And you still see Charles Seston standing there before Pharaoh and saying, Moses, Moses. He was recognized. Yes. And I can really understand the fact. I have limitations, Lord. So have I. After all these years of being in Canada, I still stand in fear behind this sacred desk because I know unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through me to your heart, it will not accomplish anything. My words are nothing unless the Holy Spirit begins to magnify in your heart that he has a message for you. And so we understand his human point of view as being justified. But that is the wrong perspective. Because God is saying something that is so significant. I'm going with you. You are not alone. What God is really saying, Moses, trust me. And what God is saying to you this morning is, whatever your situation might be, trust me. But Lord, I have waited so many years. What are you telling me? <coughs> that I have to learn patience? What about you? Are you a patient individual who can trust the Lord? Remember, God is working on Moses for 40 years. And God is showing him 
his greatness. And for encouragement, Moses is given a remarkable revelation of who God is and what he is like, a revelation which climaxes in this tremendous statement of five one-syllable words. I am who I am. Now, on the back of your bulletin, if you turn it over to the back side and you get your pen out because I want you to be active this morning, not only listening, but also be active, you see there are lines that need to be filled in because you have four letter words that are set there, purpose, power, provision, personification, and you need to fill in the lines that I'm going to suggest to you so that you may reflect on the message even as you go home and ask yourself, am I trusting God in my life for my situation? The first thing that I want you to take home this morning is the great I am says, the I am of authentic purpose. The I am of authentic purpose. Look for a moment at the setting of that simple but majestic statement that is meaning, that its meaning may be indelibly imprinted on our minds and may forever fortify our faith. Moses is tending his sheep when unexpectedly on the Mount of Horeb, the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And Moses saw that. Though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. That is recorded in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And prompted by curiosity, Moses approached to investigate this strange sight, but stopped in his track when God called him, Moses, Moses, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. The place where you are sitting is holy ground. When God starts talking to us, all of a sudden, the ground itself becomes holy. God was in the burning bush the symbolism is tremendously significant and amid the flames of cruel oppression, Israel is threatened again with extinction, only to be preserved by the presence of God in their midst. In his presence, Moses must remove his sandals. For God is holy. He is perfect. He is pure. In him, there are no faults, no flaws, no weakness. But the original word used emphasizes as well that God is exalted above every creature on earth and in heaven. 
Beloved, this signifies something that hasn't changed throughout the centuries. Our God is a sovereign Lord. And let the earth and all men tremble in his presence and let his people trust him without reservation. In verse 7, this God of glory and power reveals that he is also the God of wondrous mercy. And the Lord said, I have surely seen, will you underline, oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry, underline that because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Underline that in your Bible. Please let me go back to these three particular words, oppression, cry, and sorrows. What do these signify? God is a God of compassion. God is not indifferent. He is deeply moved, not only with his own people, the people of God, Israel, but the same God is also a God of compassion in your life. He knows your oppression, whatever they might be. He has seen your tears, whatever they might have been. And they even know your secret sorrows that you carry with you. He is deeply moved and thus God commissions Moses to deliver the captive nation in Egypt. But we can understand it, that this is a very frightening job. And when Moses told God of his inability to be an eloquent preacher and speaker, God already knew that before. So he raises up an Aaron, who would be his spokesman in the court of Egypt, according to Exodus chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. But Moses isn't finished. Have you noticed? He is like us. Moses used a different argument, reminding God of something that you and I might see too in our lives and in other lives, stubbornness. Have you ever been accused of being a stubborn individual? So you can really see. Moses is saying, God, these are stubborn people. What are they asking for my credentials? What is standing behind my name? And he asked, whom shall I say send me? And you know the amazing thing is God gives us an answer to through Moses. Look at verse 14 and 15 again. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial 
to all generations. Can you see the authentic purpose? This is my memorial to all generations. Israel might be put aside for a while, but it will come back once the church age of grace has ended, and it might end even before our service is over. But we are not going into a prophetic study this morning, but we are going to stay with the text. I not only want you to see the authentic purpose of the I am, but I want to secondly see something, the I am of amazing power. God is not indifferent. He is deeply moved with our sufferings and our needs, and he reaches out with a hand and heart and we know that deliverance must and will come. Now notice God who preserves and saves introduces Moses as to the God of our fathers. And then he adds something. This is so significant the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Who are these patriarchs? What were their characteristics? Abraham was a man with a vision but he had a superlative faith. You remember his faith? 75 years old, go out of the land into a land that I will show you. And here the 75 year old man begins his journey. And what about Isaac? Isaac was the covenant child. The child that was promised. And Jacob, who became known later on as Israel, if you can summarize Jacob's life Probably you could say this, he was the problem child. Have you had a problem child in your family? You know what I'm talking about. You know all what comes along. I don't have to tell you. We have had four children. And if you tell me, I can tell you some things about my children and about the problem child. Oh, yes. And you probably can, so, can say so, too. <coughs> Jacob, God's problem child. And with them, God, remember, with them, God had established a covenant, a relationship of love extending to their descendants. He is Israel's God who keeps the covenant he has made. He is always faithful, and his promises will always come true. And this God of Israel's deliverance is the God of your and my salvation. And scripture makes it very clear and says something, and I want you to be thrilled with it. If you belong to Christ, 
then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise found in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. The God to whom we belong and with whom you and I commune, and I hope you commune with him daily, is holy and majestic and mighty to save. Were anything less, salvation would be impossible. Think of his greatness. Think of his amazing power to save and glorify his name as you sit this morning in anticipation of celebrating the Lord's Supper. Someone has versif versified Psalm 66. Let me read it to you. All lands to God in joyful sound, aloft your voices raise. Sing forth the honor of his name, and glorious make his praise. O come, behold the works of God, his mighty doing see, in dealing with the sons of men, most wonderful is he. Rejoice in the I am of amazing power. And as you look back over your life, as I look back over my life, I can truly say I experienced it. You are not like the soldiers that came to Jesus to take him in. You remember him? You remember them and you remember him, the Lord Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane? Here did Jehovah's name disarm the multitude. Jesus went forward and said to them, whom are you seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And you remember what Jesus said? I am he. And now, when he said this, I am he, you remember what happened to the soldiers? They all fell. They fell to the ground, according to John chapter 18, verses 4 to 6. And the explanation of that miraculous event is very simple. Jesus is God. Why do I bring this in here? I want you to show that we are serving a living Christ, a God who is and who was and who will be and is the same yesterday and today and forever, and nothing can change that. He is the great I am, and only after he released this immeasurable power could they proceed and arrest him and slay him. You see, the demoralized, frightened, and helpless soldiers fell to the ground, and it was only when Christ's power was withdrawn that they rose to their feet and they bound him, their prisoner. But remember, he was God. His name was God's name. But unfortunately, the men were too blind to see the significance of this hallowed moment. This great I am, he sees, he hears, and he is very concerned about you. A godly man 
of bygone days, penned down these words, and I like to use them, words from Frederick W. Faber. No earthly father loves like thee, no mother half so mild, bears and forbears as thou hast done with me, thy sinful child. The great I am has an amazing power, not only of bygone days, but even today. And this brings me to my third point, the I am of assured provision. God found and delivered his people in Egypt and led them on their journey to the promised land. He wished them to know and to remember that their Redeemer would never leave them. And when God said to Moses, I am who I am, he declared that he is the eternal and unchangeable one. What a contrast to all those so-called great men of our day. They are changing their colors as they go along. They are not like our unchangeable God. Here I stand. No. Here I fumble. Today I say something and tomorrow I say something else. And I don't believe in an unchangeable God. These are words that you hear these days. They don't believe that this portion of scripture is still applicable today. Either I believe in all of what this word is saying or I have a big problem. Either I believe in cover to cover what this word is saying in the original manuscript, or I have a problem. But you see, men are changing today. They are trying to put everything into a different humanistic opinion and projection. Our God never changes. He is unchangeable, and to add to it, he is faithful. He preserves his people and keeps his promises. <clears throat> Have no fear what he says. He will do it. And those he loves, he will never, never forsake. You see, 400 years before, God had already predicted what would happen to Israel as recorded in Genesis chapter 46 and Genesis chapter 50? And he has said 400 years before, he will test and try his people, but he will never forget them. Nothing has changed, right? Our God is not finished with Israel, beloved, though some of them, of the so-called theologians, try to tell us that Israel has been discarded. No, it has been set aside. It's being tested, but it's coming back. And soon, very soon, the church, great, uh, church age is over, and we won't be here anymore. Because I believe 
and I hope you do too, in the rapture. So I believe that the I am of assured provision does not only apply to the people of Israel, but to you and me. And this brings me to my last point. The I am of abiding personification. For us, these words, I am who I am, have been given a fuller and richer meaning because Jesus himself in the New Testament gives us an identification of himself as the incarnation of the eternal and unchangeable God when he says in John chapter 8, verse 58, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And now I'm saying to you, behold, your eternal and faithful God, who in the fullness of time sent his son to save us from our sins. He is the same yesterday and today and forever, as Hebrews chapter 13, 8 says. But I want you, just for a moment yet, to see this great I am as he appears to us in the Gospel of John as the one who says, I am the bread of life. John chapter 6, 35. He says, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8, 12. He says, I am the door. John chapter 10, verse 9. He says, I am the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the true vine. John 15, verse 1. You want more? I could go on. But that suffices to show you whom we have on our side. The great I am is here. And in response, you are invited this morning to come and to celebrate the Lord's Supper. You see, the Lord's Supper points us not only to the great I am, but to the one out of whose veins, the blood of forgiveness has flown. And we have this fountain of life today, and we can draw from Evan Emmanuel's veins and will know this blood that the Lord Jesus shed, the great I am, never loses its power. You're saying, but Pastor Fred, I have committed so many sins. Then I say to you, repent. Bring them to the cross. The great I am, whose blood was shed for you and me, forgives and forgives and forgives and you can rejoice in knowing that there is a fountain filled with blood you remember the words from first john chapter 1 if we confess our sins 
He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All, not some. That's the great I am. Meet him at the table again. Oh, I invite you, in the name of Jesus, come, take part in this beautiful, marvelous Lord's Supper. May I have the privilege of inviting the deacons to come and join me at the table and let us together celebrate what he has left as a remembrance of his